looks like we have several people with us today. And, and as always, we want to thank you for attending. Uh, this is our final Great Books presentation in this very unusual year. And uh, we want to thank everybody who has participated, both as presenters and uh, those who have attended. Uh, if you were around for some chatter here at the beginning, we, we fully intend to uh, uh, be back in the fall and, and hopefully be back uh, in our sort of physical location of the collab uh, with uh, some more presentations. So uh, please join us. Uh, today, I have the privilege of uh, introducing Andrea Broomfield. Andrea holds a PhD in English from Temple University, uh, where she emphasized her studies uh, in uh, Victorian and Edwardian era journalism. Uh, here at JCCC, she is chair of the Subcommittee on General Education and Cultural Diversity. She is on Ed Affairs. She is on the statewide KBOR General Education Articulation Committee. Uh, she is the chair of the English department. And uh, she co-teaches a special topics course with Chef Aaron Prater that offers Friends of the Taste uh, Chef's table dinners showcasing student work. And if I am correct, I think their next go round is going to emphasize the historic cuisines of New Orleans and Kansas City. Yes. So that is something certainly to look forward to. Please understand that that is a quick rundown of her participation and, uh, and service. Uh, she is quite involved. Uh, her personal interests uh, lie in sort of the research of food history, particularly uh, that of Kansas City and the UK. Uh, her recent work explores the distinction between Atlantic Celtic foodways and those of England. And she has a forthcoming book uh, on Kansas City's lost iconic restaurants. And some of you may have heard her presentation with the College Scholars Program earlier this semester on that. Uh, today, she's going to be presenting on Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Gatto. And uh, when we reached out to her to ask her why, uh, <laughs> this was her response. Uh, it is germane to what we have had to endure this year with the pandemic. It speaks to the trials we must endure existentially and physically. Although not initially a fan of the play, it has never left me. And it continues to resonate as I confront the absurdities an inexplicable tragic comedy of life. Absolutely, the absurdities and inexplicable tragic comedy of life. Uh, so, uh, Andrea, presentation's yours. Thank you for helping us today. Thanks so much, Michael, and also Maureen, for continuing the work of organizing our great books lecture series, and to Jody Dietz and the Collab Tech Team for facilitating these lectures. More than ever, this lecture series is vital to bringing JCCC and the wider community together for such stimulating conversations about books that matter. And I'm flattered to have been asked to contribute to such a popular series. I'd like to pause just to make sure that everybody can hear me okay. Great, okay. Well, to play off of what Michael said, the first time that I confronted Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot, I was a full of myself, pretentious and privileged English major. I could move seamlessly from discussions of Chaucer to Dante to Dickens to Wordsworth. I could dissect a text with whether ism was the most fashionable at the time. And yet Beckett's play left me confused, bored, critical, and sometimes angry. I could not fathom why I had to waste time on it. I couldn't fathom what it meant or why I was forced to study it. And frankly, the professor who taught my 20th century modern literature class at Exeter University in the UK was not much help either. But I will say this, as with the best art, be it film, a painting, or in this case, a play, perhaps you recognize that it's great because liking it really is beside the point. It just comes to you unbidden at various moments in your life as a commentary on or as a salve to the events that consume you. And so when Maureen and Michael first approached me about doing a lecture for this great book series, I did not consciously think of a play that I had disliked all those years ago. No, I thought of the novels that had left a profound and positive impression on me, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte and Middlemarch by George Eliot. Mind you, Maureen and Michael approached me about this talk prior to COVID. We were sitting in my office. None of us were wearing masks. I'm looking at my wall of books. 
But by the time I had to make a decision, we were in the midst of this frightening, and for some in my audience, actually terrifying event, magnified by months of weather events that result from climate change. And then add to the pandemic and the weather events, increasing racial, economic, and political unrest around the world and in the United States. And unbidden, Waiting for Godot kept coming back to me, urging me to rethink why I was so mystified by that play all those years ago, why I was so angry by its meaninglessness. And I realized that some force was compelling me to go back and revisit this play. Why? Because I had come to a time in my life where I was facing an anxiety and despair and a helplessness that was essential for me to appreciate why what Waiting for Godot was really about. And I know that many in this audience will identify with my reasons for presenting on this play today, the lack of expert that I am, because they, like me, have been brought to a position in their lives where, like it or not, Waiting for Godot not only makes perfect sense, but it also comforts and helps us come to terms with what it means to be human, to confront how helpless and scared we feel, to confront mortality. I realized that my initial frustration and impatience with this play resembled that of its earliest audiences. Most of them experienced playgoers, well-educated and privileged, much like I thought of myself all those years ago at Exeter. When it premiered on January the 3rd, 1953, at a tiny avant-garde theater in Paris, the audience was so incensed by the utter meaningless of the play that the curtain was pulled after Lucky's monologue in Act One. Repeatedly in its first performances across Europe, audiences booed and heckled. And at its premiere in the United States in Miami, Florida, most of the audience left after the intermission of Act One. And you can see there from this headline from the drama critic from the Miami Herald, what really I think gets at the heart of the problem. And it's that word mink clad. In other words, the audience was, was highly privileged. In writing about why that initial audience could not understand the play and could not see what Beckett was doing, Martin Eslin in Theater of the Absurd argues that it was because they were too sophisticated. They were loaded with expectations about what a play should be and do. I was that audience, loaded with expectations, particularly my understanding of what a play should adhere to. In other words, the three unities are sometimes called the Aristotelian unities. Plausible connected actors or unity of action, action that takes place in a concentrated period of time, unity of time, action that takes place in a single setting, unity of place. Waiting for Godot does follow these unities or these rules, if you will. But if all three of the rules are based on the assumption of action, something happening, then what we see is Beckett disregarding those rules. Another reason for the earliest audience's dislike of the play, Professor Nick Mount speculates in his brilliant 2009 University of Toronto lecture, was because, because the play was entirely without pretense. The language is unpretentious, it's set in a wasteland with one tree, largely dead. And aside from Estragon and Vladimir, we only have three other characters, a boy, Lucky, and Pazzo. More importantly, Estragon and Vladimir, Mount goes on to argue, were themselves stripped of all pretense by age and by circumstance. No youth, no nice car, no house, no money. And thus their circumstances forced them to confront head on what pretenses are designed to distract them and by extension, us, the audience, from doing, grappling with the fact that we were born with our mothers straddling the grave, as Professor Mount puts it. Pazzo in Act Two puts it this way, they give birth the side of a grave, the light gleams an instant, and then it's night once more. The most famous quip about Waiting for Godot comes from the late Irish critic and professor Vivian Mercer, who wrote in 1956 in the Irish Times that Waiting for Godot has achieved a theoretical impossibility, a play in which nothing happens twice. So how did this play go from being received by audiences who shouted such things as, this is the reason we lost the colonies when Waiting for Godot premiered in London in 1955, to being voted in 1999 the most significant English play of the 20th century in a poll conducted by the British Royal National Theater. Simply put, the play grows in significance and profundity 
When we find ourselves rendered powerless, stripped of pretense, hopeless, helpless, scared, and disabled, through call it what you please, fate, God, circumstances, forces beyond our control, mistakes that we make that have unforeseen tragic consequences, I would argue that it's a play that did not lend itself to the trappings usually associated with theater going at that time period, and frankly today often, with fancy seats and expensive tickets and fancy pre-dinner shows and post-theater suppers. Waiting for Godot is at its most powerful, I would argue, when it comes at you like it did to me at the onset of COVID, unbidden at a time in our lives where what many of us had taken for granted was suddenly up for questioning a time when another of Beckett's early characters speaks to the truth of all Beckett's work. Was it to be laughter or tears? It came to the same thing in the end. If you've never read or seen Waiting for Godot, it's quite easy for me to summarize it for you. It goes like this. Two vagabonds, Vladimir and Estragon, nicknamed Didi and Gogo, are awaiting the arrival of a man called Godot. They have been told, they think, to wait at this location by this tree for Godot to arrive. We in the audience do not know who Godot is and why he matters because Godot never arrives and Gogo and Didi never explain. Gogo and Didi nevertheless wait. They frequently say, let's go, and sometimes they even walk to the edge of the stage, but they never go anywhere. In the first act, Didi and Gogo are surprised by the sudden entrance of Pazo, ostensibly a wealthy, powerful man with Lucky, ostensibly Pazzo's slave, attached to a rope leash and carrying a basket, a stool, a suitcase, a whip, and a coat, Pazzo's possessions. In the first act, Pazzo decides to stick around, and in the course of discussion that seemingly goes nowhere and means nothing, Pazzo suggests that to pass the time, they make Lucky entertain them, first by a dance and then by thinking. And so Lucky thinks. This is considered the highlight or the most consequential portion of the play, a seemingly meaningless jumble of absurd words and ideas in a stream of conscious monologue about absurdity and ostensibly about our fate. Believe me, you can find about a thousand erudite interpretations of what lucky speech means. Anyway, a boy appears on stage as darkness falls to tell the men that Godot will not come that day, but to return the next day. Act two, the two return and again wait for Godot. This time when Pazzo and Lucky return, for reasons never explained, Lucky is mute, Pazzo is blind. They leave, Didi and Gogo wait. Darkness comes, the boy returns to tell them Godot will not make it that day. Quote, surely he will come tomorrow, end of quote. Night falls, Estragon decides to leave his boots for someone else and determines that he will look for a rope to hang himself the next day. Nonetheless, both men decide that they will return the next day to wait for Godot. They will wait. They will wait. They think they should have gone their separate ways long ago, but they decide again that it's no longer worthwhile to do so. And then the last lines of the play read, well, shall we go? Yes, let's go. The stage direction, in parentheses, they do not move. These lines reinforce what Martin Enslin calls the static nature of the play, echoing back to Estragon's famous line, nothing happens, nobody comes, nobody goes, it's awful. We should rightly think about what those lines mean, why they matter, and how they come to encapsulate so much inaction in the play. But first, it helps to know a little bit about Beckett himself. When he was asked to describe his childhood to his first biographer, he called it, quote, uneventful. To say I had a happy childhood, I, I could say that I have a happy childhood, although I have little talent for happiness. He was born in the Fox Rock suburb of Dublin to a well-off family. They were Anglo-Irish and had almost nothing to do with the Catholic Irish that surrounded them. He was educated at Portora Royal School a school that Oscar Wilde had attended earlier, and then Trinity College, Dublin. It was while he was in Dublin that he became ensconced, ensconced with the Dublin theater scene. That's really important to take into account because Dublin was the epicenter of theater, and it had all kinds of theater, all of which Beckett really took in, including uh, classical Irish theater, Irish national theater, as well as vaudeville and slapstick. 
He moved to Paris, but returned to Dublin in 1931 to finish a master's in French at Trinity College. And then he settled permanently in France in 1932. Of course, that sounds nice and easy, but as we're going to be talking about in a bit, uh, this was an incredibly uh, important time in his life as an artist because of the war. He received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1969, and he's buried in the Montparnasse Cemetery in Paris. In terms of the play itself, it first premiered, like I told you, in 1953, and it was originally written in Fran French, but because Beckett was bilingual, he also translated his French play into English. And I appreciate this fact because with all of Beckett's work, there's not a, a translator that's actually in any way uh, interfering or misinterpreting what Beckett wanted to, what he wanted to say. In terms of theater, the absurd, I like this comment by Nasrullah Mamrul, who writes that the play was the first truly successful play in a genre known as theater of the absurd. And like other absurdist plays, it asks a serious question, does the human condition have meaning? And I would stress that what matters the most is the effectiveness of how this question is asked and not the artist's attempt to provide any answer to it. Samuel Beckett had very little to offer critics and viewers when they asked him what the play meant. And he would usually just shrug and say that it was, quote, a tragicomedy in two acts. Again, the focus is on an utter lack of pretense from this playwright of stripping meaning down to only the two things that remain when there is nothing else. Professor Mount elucidates, what laughter and tears have in common is that they dissolve pretense. They cut through poses. They force us to take off whatever mask we happen to be wearing, leaving us exposed. We are reduced to either laughing or to crying, laughter or tears, comedy or tragedy, and then death. But I show these two masks that represent comedy and tragedy because they originated in ancient Greece and they were worn by the actors because the theaters were designed so that people who were sitting far away could not really make out the expression of the actors on the stage. And so these masks help to clarify, is it sad or is it funny? I should point out that Waiting for Godot today is often performed by amateurs and that it resonates strongly with the dispossessed as audiences and also as actors. The third mounting of the play in the United States was at San Quentin Prison on the 19th of November in 1957. And it was important to the play beginning to receive the critical acclaim that we come to associate it with. As Russell M. Deblin, the managing editor of American Theater Journal tells the story, Waiting for Godot was largely an unimpressive play for Broadway audiences, and it had left that Miami audience a year earlier upset and perplexed. And yet when the San Francisco's Actors Workshop put it on before 1,000 plus hardened convicts at a maximum security prison, it riveted the men to their seats and it received national press coverage. I would suggest that this performance and the coverage represented that critical aha moment that audiences initially perplexed and frustrated by the play suddenly understood that the problem really was with them, not with Beckett and not with the play itself. Demlin noted that to prepare the San Quentin audience for the play, director Herbert Blau gave a short speech. The audience had just listened to the prison jazz band and Blau explained that the play was a lot like jazz and that one must listen for whatever one may find. For each, there will be some meaning, some reaction, and dressed in what we hope is good theater. Ed Reed, who was a jazz vocalist and former San Quentin inmate who performed with the band that evening, remembered that Godot was pretty special and everybody loved it. The decision to stage this play really had to do with logistics because it wasn't possible to bring women actors into a maximum security prison. The set was uncomplicated, not to mention the costuming. I think that today it's a given that the play resonated with the convicts because they identified powerfully with the notion of waiting around for nothing, of the futility of action when there was no place to go. And yet repeatedly in this play, there's also the chance of hope, of redemption, and the importance of companionship and love that manifests itself. 
I'd always uh, like the idea of trying to bring in some clips to listen to, but I'm always afraid that I'll screw up the technology. Uh, but I think that this particular passage in Act One illustrates that issue of companionship. Vladimir, when I think of it all these years, but for me, where wouldn't you be? You'd be nothing more than a little heap of bones at the present moment, no doubt about it. Estragon, and what of it? Vladimir, gloomily, it's too much for one man. Pause, cheerfully. On the other hand, what's the good of losing heart now? That's what I say. Beckett wrote Waiting for Godot shortly after World War II. He once famously quipped that he preferred France in war to Ireland in peace. Remember that Beckett was an Anglo-Irish expat. But during the war, Beckett had joined the French resistance in Paris. When this group was infiltrated, however, by a double agent and portrayed to the Gestapo, Beckett was forced to flee. He escaped to the unoccupied part of France in 1942 and worked as a farm laborer undercover until the war's end. Now, I cannot imagine a more desolate and hopeless time than living through the Nazi occupation of France in World War II, and undoubtedly Beckett's experience had a profound impact on the man as an artist. Having said that, Beckett as an artist was one of the most circumspect and disinterested consumers of his own work, more annoyed and sometimes amused by the contortions that critics and literary scholars would go through to read his plays and understand them especially waiting for Godot. Again, it helps to stress what director Herbert Blau had told the San Quentin the convicts, one must listen for whatever they find. For each, there will be some meaning, some reaction, and dressed in what we hope is good theater. Another set of performances that took place in November 2007 in New Orleans's Lower Ninth Ward had significant parallels with the San Quentin performance in that the audiences were through circumstance and a nasty twist of fate in the best possible position to appreciate Waiting for Godot. The best retelling of these four performances is by actor Wendell Pierce. Some of you might know Pierce, best known for his role as Detective Buck Moreland on HBO's hit series, The Wire, and who is a native New Orleanian and author of the fascinating memoir, Wind in the Reeds, A Storm, A Play, and The City That Would Not Be Broken. Pierce explains how the New York visual artist and publisher, Paul Chan, visited the Lower Ninth Ward two years after Katrina and could not get Waiting for Godot out of his mind. Well, no wonder. Hurricane Katrina literally destroyed wide swaths of the Gulf Coast, including Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, and especially New Orleans, when on the 29th of August, a storm surge caused 53 levee breaches. When the Mississippi River Gulf outlet breached its levees in roughly 20 places, most of eastern New Orleans flooded. Compounding the tragedy was the breach of the 17th Street Canal, the London Avenue Canal, and the wide industrial canal, thus leaving 80% of New Orleans underwater. The industrial canal was a vital artery for shipping to Lake Pontchartrain and two other canals out into the Gulf of Mexico. As Pierce put it, a darkness fell over New Orleans that was so intense that no light could overcome it. Hundreds drowned as a 20-foot wall of water flattened everything in its path. In moments, 14,000 African-Americans, some of the poorest in New Orleans, ceased to exist in the Lower Ninth. Nobody understood the truths of waiting for Godot, Pierce writes, better than, than the survivors of the Lower Ninth. Even though Katrina was two years out, the Ninth Ward remained a void when Chan brought the classical theater of Harlem's production of Waiting for Godot to the Ninth Ward, where Pierce played the role of Vladimir. The Ninth Ward production was staged in what was now a wasteland. Broken concrete, litter of twisted signs and posts, houses collapsing or literally gone, no businesses. The November 2nd, 2000 performance brought 600 people from all over New Orleans, from all walks of life and all races who were fed free gumbo. When the show started, the rebirth brass band began to play as people were led to the bleachers. Pierce remembered that the play was literally the only sound and sight of light in the oppressive void that surrounded them. Pierce added that the drama about two tramps waiting in a wasteland for a savior who may or may not come was likely the only piece of expressionist art that could speak so lucidly to this audience's situation. 
What made these lower ninth ward performances so powerful, Pierce wrote, was the synergy between the actors and the audience. As he recounted the experience, actors and audience experienced the rebirth of life and hope. I would ask, is it possible that Beckett designed this play to do precisely that? I come continually back to Vladimir's question, what's the point of losing heart now? In other words, are we as a society actually better off giving up? I would argue that Beckett and his characters say no, in spite of the absurdity of life as it plays out. How then might this play, Waiting for Godot, and the character's plight have a bearing on the way we cope with COVID? Certainly the tremendous uncertainty of COVID and the pain and futility that it has brought along with it has put us in the best possible position to resonate and I dare say find some comfort with the play's message. It certainly brings home to me the absurdities and foibles of people being, trying to be their best, trying to figure out what to do and how to respond to a force, a hurricane or a pandemic without any clear sense of direction. And frankly, Waiting for Godot helps me cope with the absurdities that I've had to confront because it just makes me laugh. The play incorporates Beckett's love and understanding of vaudeville and slapstick as much as it does his understanding of modernism and highbrow literature and the avant-garde. The play, in other words, simply articulates the absurdities that are part of human life. It does not try to solve or explain those absurdities away or anything like that. It simply acknowledges or validates my own sense of the world around me and the reasons why I might feel at times helpless and futile. I come back to Pierce again and the questions that Waiting for Godot raised. How do you go on when you are bone tired and in a world where nothing makes sense, when a direction forward simply leads to a ditch or a grave? How do you embrace a life in which everyone you knew and loved has been taken away and nobody else cares? I think that's the purpose of art at its best to ask these questions. Well, when I was a student back at Exeter studying Victorian literature, I loved Jane Eyre and Middlemarch because the authors dealt not in absurdity, but in realism. And they were sure of their answers and through their plots and characters, I learned what it meant to be moral, to be independent, to know right from wrong. But at this point today, with the raging pandemic and unrest and inequality and climate change, I guess I'm not interested in answers, but rather questions. Answers are to me suspected at best. And so authors whose work best pose the questions but do not act so boldly as to answer them, that I would say makes art powerful. And in the area of drama, Waiting for Godot is indeed powerful. I thought I would just conclude with Beckett's creed about art expressed in 1949. There is nothing to express, nothing with which to express nothing from which to express, no power to express, no desire to express, together with the obligation to express. And that is my, my presentation. So, <laughs> hi everybody. <laughs> hey Andrea, thank you so much. You're welcome. We have a quite a quite a large group here and diverse group um I see some uh people who are normally with us and some some new guests as well are there any questions for andrea um although maybe asking the question and not getting an answer is what we should expect but we'll see uh anybody have any questions i'll start with all of the um with the warm, warm reception that the first uh, productions received, how on earth did it continue to be produced? Well, the San Quentin, the, the San Quentin production, at least in the United States, was pretty early into the various premieres that were going, going around. And I think that there was a sense in Europe and also on Broadway where it was in performance for a time that that people were uh, rather intimidated to just show all out frustration. In other words, maybe they felt like they would, if they did that, they were being duped, that you know, they, were sh they were showing themselves to be not as sophisticated as they thought. But in terms of the United States' reception of the play, it was, it was the performance at the prison 
that really forced people to pay more attention to it and to, and to consider that it was the audience's reaction and their circumstances in life that made the play viable to them. And why would it not then make it viable to people who were in similar situations when they felt helpless and futile and powerless? So you're saying that in Europe really it was an issue of the emperor's new play that Probably, and because yeah. I mean the performances, at least in the in the research I've done, particularly in the UK, it was it was poorly received, uh, and oftentimes there were hecklers in the audience. And I think <coughs> that at that at the London premiere where somebody shouted, "This is the reason that we lost the colonies," it was that same performance when um, there's this famous scene in Act One where uh, the two gentlemen look for something to hang themselves with. And somebody in the audience shouted out, for God's sake, give them something to hang themselves with. And you know, so it created vaudeville within the actual audience itself. Any other questions? Just a, a quick question. Did um, Beckett seem to did he ever have an opportunity to see the play be better received? And if so, um, did he ever publicly say anything about that, given, given how he didn't seem to have a lot of interest in what critics might have to say? Well, there might be people in this audience who would have a better answer for that um, than me. But from the way I understand it, at, at, at many points, Beckett actually helped direct his own play. Okay. And he, he definitely witnessed the play become literally a phenomenon. And uh, you know, his, his reason for winning the Nobel Prize for literature, I think might largely be based on this particular play. So he, was, you know, he, he, he lived uh, uh, into the late 20th century and he, he was aware of how the play was favorably received over and over and became a part of the literary canon. Uh, as for talking about it, though, he was circumspect. Uh, he really had, he, he, he was such an unpretentious person for, to be a, a Nobel Prize winner. And uh, he would just often shrug his shoulders. And, and, you know, I think he wrote the play very quickly on a child's, in a, in a, in a school child's exercise book. Uh, he scribbled it down. And I, I don't think he, he really gave it a whole lot of thought. Andrea, I'm, I'm really interested in um, his World War II experiences, uh, just um, being a farm laborer and kind of hiding out and just waiting. Is there any indication, I, I know you, you aren't presenting yourself as an expert on his whole body of work, but is there any indication earlier in what he's written that he has this inclination or can this really, do you think, be traced to World War II? Well, I, you know, uh, I'm going to go back to a quotation of his that came, it, it comes from a, a, a series of short works, Jeanette called More Kicks Than Pricks from 1934. And that's where he writes, was it to be laughter or tears? It came from the same thing. And, and this, this is, uh, I think, indicative of where he is coming from. 1934 is, is not a time of war by any means, but it certainly is a time mm -hmm. of tremendous unrest uh, that's building in Europe, particularly in Germany, and also with the Great Depression. And of course, this is a worldwide depression. Mm -hmm. But I think that Beckett, Beckett also, he, he, didn't, he didn't have a happy childhood, or he, he felt like he was not a happy person. He had a really strange childhood. Um, again, I'm not an expert, but from the biographies that I've read of him, uh, he dealt with an awful lot of struggle that came from his own family life and then ultimately from living in what he felt to be a very repressive country, that being Ireland. Uh, and, the, and the fact that the Catholic censors would oftentimes take so much out of works of literature, including drama, um, rendering it meaningless. And so I think that there were many points in his life where he felt the absurdities of his existence, but there's no doubt to me that the, the Nazi occupation 
of France and the hopelessness that that was that period would have definitely come into play in, in his understanding of theater of absurd. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you. I think similar to Jeanette's comment or question, I was thinking at, at the same time of <clears throat> Albert Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus. And I thought, I, I actually just very quickly looked it up to double check the, the date. And so <clears throat> I am I'm surprised that there was not a, a more initial in-depth reflection on those same types of themes when the that play was first performed. So that was just more of a comment than a question. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent, it's an excellent observation. Andrea, I appreciate it so much, your uh, desire to connect that play to our present condition. And uh, I couldn't help but think whether it was the uh, performance in New Orleans or the performance at San Quentin, that those audiences were able to be an audience. Mm -hmm. And that maybe the thing that separates their situations from ours is that we have to do this this way, mm -hmm. right? That we can't be shoulder to shoulder with somebody and, and share that viewing. Um, so, I mean, do, do you think do you think we're going to be looking to art for some utility or, or do you think there will be something born out of that with our, our current situation? It seems that there are many performances of Waiting for Godot going on right now <laughs> in, in many different strange, absurd configurations, including Zoom. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I, I can't think of a, a better play to illustrate the craziness of, of what we have had to endure. I, I imagine that that there's a, a real uptick of interest right now in Beckett uh, because of COVID. But I'm, you know, that's just my speculation. But I, I, I didn't mean to look up where the play was being performed or anything like that. But of course, I Googled it a lot to try to get ready for this presentation. I was astonished at, at how popular the play is and how many how many places are, are, are preparing to perform it coming out of COVID? That's another thing. In other words, mm -hmm. you know, you can get tickets to what they assume will be a live performance by, by the summer even. The ultimate gamble. Right. <laughs> are there any other questions, observations? I have a weird kind of question, if you're up for it. Um, Breath. Have you watched performances of Breath? No. Okay. okay. I was just going to ask. You, it, it, it's like a, a two minute play or a 30 second play or something. It's really very short. It just starts with primal scream, rubbish goes across the stage, and then it ends with primal scream. And that's pretty much it. And when people went to, to see it, they were really angry. <laughs> so I was just wondering if you had any thoughts. I just, I'm a Beckett fan, so. I know, but, I, but I'll put that on my list to watch. I love oh. the fact that it's so short too. It'll take you just a few seconds to watch. And there's a okay. ton of productions. They're, they're, they're astounding. Okay, thanks for that, Monica. <laughs> Andrea, do you mind a question based entirely in ignorance? Um, <laughs> Well, especially if you don't mind an answer based entirely in ignorance. Excellent. This is a conversation I can have. Uh, I managed to become a, a college English professor knowing nothing about this play whatsoever. Um, I assume that Godot is seen by some people as representing God. Um, is there any indication in the play, therefore, that Godot is dead? There's no indication that he is alive or that he's dead other than the fact that you have this boy mm -hmm. who comes on the stage at the end of act one and then presumably it's his twin at the end of act two who who says you need to come back surely he'll come back tomorrow and i think there's a lot of there's a lot of inflection of voice put on that word surely surely he'll come back tomorrow or surely he will come back tomorrow and so 
I, I do think that there's a lot of great criticism out there about the notion that Godot is God, but there's also a lot of criticism out there that would suggest that Godot is Pazo, the ostentatious, the ostentatious wealthy, powerful man who comes on stage uh, with, with his slave, Lucky, leading him via a rope. So, but I mean, look at the spelling, G-O-D-O-T. Well, and it's not just the spelling, it's the, it's the pronunciation for somebody that's bilingual God in English, English and French, because God in English and Dieu is God in French. So Godot is God in English and French. So, and the yeah. play is all about presumably salvation of some sort, because if Godot does show up, are they going to come to him on their hands and knees in prostration? Yes, that's what they're planning. Yeah. Why? Because they're tied down. Why? Because they are in supplication. And so the, the language, the play is, has so many biblical references. Uh, and yet so many of those references are turned on their head, uh, especially in the, in the beginning where, where Vladimir starts off on this. Why is it that one of the convicts was saved? And do you know your Bible? Oh, yes, I know my Bible, says Estragon. I, I love the, the front pages, the maps, the colors of the maps, and the, you know, the fact that we wanted to go on our honeymoon there. I mean, there's, so there's plenty of, there's plenty of spiritual references, definitely. Thanks. Yeah. Andrea? Yes. Um, you mentioned that a lot of criticism has been done on um, Lucky's speech or his tirade. Um, why do you think that is so attractive to people? Well, it's a, and of course, Maureen, you probably know it better than me because you were going to recite it in Irish for me drunk, right? So <laughs> I, I think that it has, it has so many resonances with the stream of consciousness that would obviously be associated with James Joyce, who was a mentor to Samuel Beckett. Uh, and when you take apart the monologue and you really begin to look carefully at it, it, it seems like it has a lot to do with what Dave is talking about, about, about religion and spiritualism and, and salvation. But it's so incredibly funny as well because it has so much body humor in it. It's kind of like the Carmina Burana that if you really start to take it apart, you can see lots of allusions to sexuality, uh, to bodily function, as well as high polluting language that's mixed in with, with various gibberish that would represent stream of consciousness. So I guess because, it, it, because Lucky stands there and he thinks, he has to have his hat on to think, and he, and he says more than anybody else says at one time in the play, it just, it's just literally a focal point. And it draws the audience in, and I, I can't imagine not wanting to try to analyze what it could mean. And so it lends itself to lots and lots of interesting interpretations. But but to me, it's uh, the the power of the play is that nothing is answered, that there is nothing profound or necessarily profound in it. It's what you get out of it yourself that 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 matters. And I think that to read messages into it as I've seen so many people attempt to do, uh, makes them kind of the laughing stock, at least in the way I would imagine Beckett would see them. Are there any other questions, comments? All right, Andrea, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. It's great to see you all. Hopefully the next time we'll be in the collab. Hopefully. Maureen, I think you have some final words for us. Yes, uh, of course, we do want to thank absolutely everybody who was involved in this, the collabs, particularly Andrea. Uh, we'll hope to see you next year. There's one other, well, probably more than one, but one other book related event that we're going to point to. Um, Sarah Smarsh will be doing a public presentation on Thursday, April 16th, if you are interested. Um, it is Thursday at 1230. I have put the link to register in the chat, or you can find it on the um, uh, webpage on the events uh, for JCCC.
that, thank you very much.